What happens at that point, more neutrophils get attracted towards that um, alveolar space, alveolar space, getting a signal that there are cells that has to be destroyed because they have viral infection in it. So all the cells are doing their own job, but it's not in a con on T2 cells, you get less and less surfactant, you get less and less oxygen exchange. As a result, you will finally fill this space with um, fluid and no surfactant, and that is a very serious situation. So this is what is shown over here. That's where you really have to be hospitalized, and a secondary treatment starts for secondary infection with any kind of antibiotics. So there's a high chance of secondary infection at that point. This is when you have the acute respiratory distress syndrome. And many of the patients are going transferred to ICU or ventilator. And then the inflammation becomes severe and the protein rich fluid that you see over here now starts leaking into the main circulatory system and spreading all over the body. As it does, it also carries the virus. And this fluid is also going to cause other complications and it is also going to cause inflammatory responses all over the body. And ultimately to a condition which is called SARS, which is septic shock, and that septic shock is going to cause in untreated most of the time to multi-organ failure. And that's what leads to death. So what is happening in the hosp after hospitalization, people are taking, the doctors are taking all kinds of precautionary measures in order to stop or slow down the progress from here to this stage and perhaps stop it right over here and give the lungs time in order to clear the fluid and come back to normal functioning again. Now we are treating uh, the patients with antibiotics as a precautionary measure. Now you might say why we are treating an antibiotic against a viral disease is because of the secondary infections that can happen. And we are using dexamethasone in order to reduce the inflammatory response so that we do not have too much crowding of these inflammatory cells in, that, in the lung because it's becoming self-destructive. So that's why these are the two drugs of choice at the hospital after the severity of the disease has kicked off. Now, what happens at the cellular level? This is talking about the symptoms and how th what things are happening at the tissue level or the organ level. So the, in the cell, what we have is these viruses. Most of the viruses, they take the advantage of a host cell receptor. And here, this particular virus, SARS-CoV-2, is recognized by S2 receptor which is an angiotensin converting enzyme to the receptor. So this receptor basically recognizes the virus spike protein as shown over here. And then it internalizes the virus by a process called endocytosis. And then it forms a vacuole over here, which is acidic, slices only vacuole. And the particular interaction between the spike protein and the S2 receptor has been modeled recently that how it is happening. This is a model structure shown over here in a um, more close-up. What happens is that the cells, after it enters into the, the virus entering into the cell, kind of hijacks the system, the replication or the machinery of the cell in order to replicate itself. So if you look over here, it escapes the vacuum, and then it starts replicating itself using its own RNA-dependent polymerase, but all the other machineries like ligosomes and nucleic acids from the first 
So once it synthesizes the um, negative scan, those are going to get transcribed and then they are going to produce proteins in the kids from them. Some of the proteins are structural proteins. Some of them are associated with a function. For example, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And then there is a protein that's not the nucleocapsid protein, which helps the RNA molecule to be folded into its final form. And then it kind of guards it off. Now notice when it bites, okay? and then it has all the proteins that it displays on the surface. So there are several treatments that are being used now to target this pathway. But how can we better target, um, better control the replication of this virus? So I'm going to give you an example of a few. For example, we have heard chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine being used. So the way it works is that it kind of reduces the acidity of these vacuoles. Once it does that, then the virus has hard time to escape the vacuum. So once it is trapped within, it cannot replicate. And also hydroxychloroquine can acidify Golgi bodies. And inside the Golgi body, many of these surface proteins get glycosylated. And that glycosylation is important for the recognition by the ACE2 receptor. So this glycosylation step is inhibited because the internal pH of the Golgi body is actually raised, which has become more basic because of the action of chloroquine and hydrochloroquine. So that's how it works. The other drug that is being used is uh, remdesivir. So remdesivir is a... Um, molecule that inhibits the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It doesn't do anything to our polymerases, the host polymerases. This drug has been used for other viruses, and it is giving some positive result in combination with other drugs. So it will slow down the replication of the uh, viral RNA. The other drug that's being used is called lopinavir. And this is another drug that's being used for other viruses also. What it does, it inhibits the maturation of the proteins as they are synthesized and cleaved. So what happens is in case of a virus like coronavirus, most of the proteins are synthesized as a long polyprotein. So here are two polyproteins shown over here. One in blue, the other in cyan. And then there is an enzyme, which is a protease, that is a viral protease that cleaves this protein. And then the proteins, this polyprotein is cleaved into small proteins. And these small proteins each has its own function. And then they get folded. So if you do not cleave them, these proteins are not going to be functional. So this particular protease is very important. And you all know that HIV protease inhibitors were targeted against the HIV protease. So that was one of the three drugs that is used for HIV also. So HIV has also a um, reverse transcriptase inhibitor and a protease inhibitor in that regimen that is used for um, as anti-HIV drug to keep the viral load down. So this particular drug actually inhibits the protease so that you do not get the cleavage and you do not get active protein. Without this protein, the virus is not going to be able to replicate itself and then get out of the cells. So there are two things that I have discussed. One is treating the symptoms and one, the other one is treating the cause. Now, if you can um, correctly manipulate these two lines of treatment properly, then you will be able to save a lot of life. And that's what we are seeing right now, that the death rate has gone down, although the infection rate has gone high. 
And that's because with trial and error, we have come up with certain um, steroids like dexamethasone and also some protease inhibitors, some reverse transcriptase inhibitors that can be used in order to keep the viral load low or in order to get the symptoms lower so that the patient can survive enough to get this virus cycle completed. Now, is there a hope for vaccine? I think Dr. Sarkar has kind of um, summarized it very well, so I'm not going to go into the details, but I just want to tell you that the different approaches that are being taken generally in case of viruses, one is you take the entire virus, then you attenuate it, inactivate it, which is a risky one, but it acts very well. You get good reaction. But to make sure that the virus is um, inactivated, um, you can either um, do it genetically by deleting a major gene um, in the genome, or you can do it by a physical chemical method. The protein-based approaches are um, more challenging, but um, they can generate um, good response also um, in antibody response. And generally, you target the surface protein so that the virus can be attacked better when it is in outside the cell and also when it is inside the cell and expressing the surface protein on the surface of the host cell, that those host cells can be recognized and can be killed. The other approach is the nucleic acid um, approach, uh, which Dr. Sarkar also mentioned, that you can take a plasmid-based or an adenovirus-based approach where you can put a part of the gene of the or a particular gene of the uh, virus and express it through a vector, a plasmid vector or a um, adenoviral vector. And then expressing that protein, you try to get a response against it so that you can generate a um, immune response and in memory, create memory cells that will be able to help you fight the virus in future. So all three approaches are being taken and there are promising results in certain areas that are going on, going clinical trials are going on in order to get um, the results. And I think uh, maybe by the end of the year, we will be able to see some application of these um, clinical trials in the experimental drugs. The fourth one is not really vaccination, it's kind of a passive treatment with an antibody is that if you have a patient who has survived the onslaught and then you go and find the titer for the antibody in the blood, then you collect the blood and separate the serum and try to get these antibodies and treat patient who has um, severe cases in order to neutralize these viruses using soluble antibodies that are present in the serum of these patients that you have isolated. There's a little risk in there that your blood type match, although these are serum that you are taking, but there are precautions to be taken in order to do that. So it's a difficult treatment, um, but it works to a certain extent. The other approach is you take these patients um, these patients who have survived uh, do, without any severe sy sy uh, symptoms, and then you try to isolate the monoclonal antibody from there, and using a hybridoma uh, system, you culture that particular antibody against the uh, virus and uh, synthetically uh, produce it in a large quantity and use it as a drug. So these are the main four approaches that are being taken right now in order to create virus, um, the vaccines. This is where we stand. Uh, this is like an hour before I started talking, and this is from the World Health Organization where we stand right now. We have this many new cases. Um, in. Although the picture is not very good, um, but I think Considering how closely we are connected all over the world, I think it could have been worse than this. Although I agree with Dr. Shah, for the sake of economic 
reason and also for some political reasons so that um, the economy doesn't go down, that we really did not give importance to the real scientists. And it's not only in India, it also happened in other countries. And it's also happening here. And it's very unfortunate to try our best. But I think we all can contribute with your with our, you know, knowledge and respect to this particular virus and educating people around us and telling them that um, what you learn from this kind of webinar and try to spread the word. So that is very important. And I think um, we have to keep our hope alive. And as I say, do we have a hope? Yes, we do. And for like any kind of hard time, it is very difficult to see um, the end of the light at the end of the tunnel, but we have to keep hoping. Although it cannot be compared totally, but I can give you a small example. Um, do you all recognize this place? This is the this is my favorite spot on planet Earth. This is the Arambag railway station. When I was a kid, we always dreamt of that there would be a railway station in Arambag, which will allow us to communicate with Calcutta so that people can go on the same day. And, and when it happened, we were super excited. And perhaps right now it's just sitting idle, nobody's using it. Um, 